I think the, uh, the easiest way to explain it is that uh, in the olden days when I was young, we used to write computer code that would take data and munch it and do something. These days, um, AI is something that sits on the top of the computer code and it actually modifies the code depending on the data that comes in and the patterns that it sees. So uh, if you think about the way that a washing machine works, um, these, these days what you do is you put your washing into it and you dial up a particular program and that's preset and it does all of the various steps to wash your clothes in the order that the programmer decided. Um, one of the ways that AI might manifest itself is that you could actually just start to feed loads, load after load after load into your washing machine and it would adaptively decide what was the best way to actually wash your clothes depending on how you told it um, the outcome was as a consequence. It's not difficult to imagine some sort of artificial intelligence process helping us to collect better data. Certainly um, we're using satellite imagery more effectively. Um, you know, lots of people wear little um, fitness accessories which track their movements. Um, we can look at the productivity of people as they move around cities and towns. Um, so I suspect technology is part of the problem but also uh, part of the solution. We've sort of gone beyond what even Hollywood's doing with um, um, the quality of the digital characters that they're producing. But what's really interesting is the way we we bring them to life and, and we do that by you know, taking away actors and taking away cameras which have traditionally been what's used to, um, to bring computer characters or computer generated characters to life and, and literally we've uh, automated them by giving them a brain, um, creating a, a system which enables them to um, respond, interact and engage with us in exactly the same way, way we engage with each other. I don't think humans are obsolete, but I think the, the, the problem that humans have is this inability to believe that anything's going to be better than them. And that is best expressed at the higher order uh, parts of our uh, working structure. So if you think about doctors or lawyers, the sort of higher echelon of trained more years, you find that in those professions there is this sort of cognitive dissonance between how good they are and how good they think they are versus how good the software actually is. And you can see in some use cases, and there's very good examples now, and particularly in medicine, where the software, to use a broad term, is better than the best doctors in the world at diagnosis. Not in terms of choice of therapy necessarily or communicating with the patients, but in terms of tight diagnosis of very well-defined disease conditions, software's better. When I think about the strategy a business should, should employ in terms of really thinking about how do I tackle AI. I think firstly there's a fundamental decision that a CEO and a board need to make which is how seriously are you going to take it. Now at ANZ we're taking it incredibly seriously. We believe that it's going to be the platform that fundamentally drives differentiation between more and less successful financial services firms in the future. But you just, companies first and foremost need to answer that question. How fundamentally important is it for you and for your industry? One of the biggest challenges here is that uh, if you think about what is the role of uh, engineers in our world, the role of an engineer in our world is uh, to bring technological trust at scale. And if you think about um, why people were so unhappy with the uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica issues, it was because there was a fundamental breakdown in trust. Uh, and that's what um, with the whole world needs to start thinking about these days because you know when you drive across the Sydney Harbour Bridge you trust that the bridge isn't going to fall down and we are only just starting to see where artificial intelligence resides and we're only just starting to understand whether or not we can trust it. There are really really important questions about how we embed uh, ethics and our understanding of people and psychology into all of the way that we write that code and I think that's going to be um, one of the most important and profound things that we do over the next five to ten years. Building trust between man and machine is actually I think going to be a really really critical part of the way in which we use AI systems in the next 10, 20, 30 years. At what point does this digital character become engaging to the humans that they're interacting with. At what point can we relate to them? At what point can we learn to trust them? And, and what we are really trying to do by, I mean, in some ways, in, in very simple terms, putting a face on artificial intelligence, is we're trying to create a platform where people can develop the level of trust in machines, which we think is going to be really, really important um, as we spend more of our time interacting with those machines in the future. 
I think one of the things that's really hard for people, including me, quite frankly, to understand is the compression in innovation cycles. And so it feels like people are just kind of getting things like, you know, mobile under control, cloud un under control. And so it's actually somewhat hard to face into the fact that now actually AI is going to be, I think, the new differentiator between businesses that are increasingly successful versus those that aren't. The reality of the application of AI is it's a, it's a dual environment where you have better outcomes from a diagnosis perspective or from a driving perspective, but you will have an employment issue. And so what we're, going to, we're seeing even in the beginnings of that now is this massive bifurcation between very highly paid, just use data scientists as, as the proxy, and then aged care workers. And a lot of this middle ground held by professionals tends to disappear. Now, if that was disappearing over a 50-year time span, society could adjust to it as it adjusted to the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution. The reality is this is happening in a much faster time, and so society will not have the time to naturally evolve to this new bifurcation. So I think we'll see quite a bit of disruption before we get to uh, a, a new state or a new end state. The best quote I've read on AI is that for knowledge workers, it will take the robot out of the worker. Um, in the sense that things we were doing which had a repetitive element, um, which were a bit lowbrow, which took a bit of time, um, AI will help us do that. It's probably not the high-end corporate accountant which is under threat, it's the person that does um, the bookkeeping and um, look at tax returns. It's probably not the high-end lawyer that's under threat, but the person who looks at researches historical case law. Um, I hope it's the same for economists be really, really hard to do what I do and create the technology that we create if we didn't believe we could make a, an incredibly positive difference to the way we live our lives, um, the way we go about doing our work, the communities we live in and the societies that we create.